This video is the third part of this series. In the first two episodes, we saw how we can set up Hypersistence Optimizer and how we can fix the JPN Hibernate configuration issues that were detected by this performance tuning tool. In this video, we're going to see how we can fix the entity mapping issues. So it generates the events for the mappings and we can see here, so these are all the events. Actually, those are also the events related to when it runs, it also has some events related to the queries that are generated. But for the configuration properties, it's zero. We, we got rid of them. But we have, as you can see here, we have four mappings. We have a lot of uh, by entity type. So we have many to many list, bidirectional, table generator. So we have also some issues that we are going to uh, go through next that are related to the mappings that we have uh, used for our entities. And we can also fix those. And you will see here in Git that every, every commit that follows is going to address one of those mapping uh, issues. Like for instance, this one here, let's uh, check, check it out. This one here tries to fix the table generator. Let's go there and see it. That was one of the issues that was being reported. And for a very good reason, actually, because if you take a look here, almost all the entities in this project used the table generator. Now, this table generator started as a great idea, like you could have a generator that would be portable. You could use it on Postgres, Oracle, SQL Server, MySQL, no matter whether the database supported identity or sequence, it didn't matter, that one would have been portable. It's portable, yes, it is portable, but it's terrible in terms of performance. It requires fetching an extra connection from the pool to create a new transaction just for uh, the scope of generating the ID. So it creates uh, contention on the connection pool level. It takes row level locks. It's to be avoided. In this case, we're much better off to use uh, the sequence generator. Now, the only downside here, if you're using MySQL, you wouldn't have it. If you're using other databases, you would have it. So for MySQL, there is a trick. We could basically use uh, the identity uh, generator. But in this case, we're running, actually we're running this on H2 for the integration test and we have sequences. Let's assume that it's Postgres or Oracle. We can use sequences or SQL Server in the same way. Only in MySQL, you don't have proper database sequences. So how you, uh, how you would migrate, you would basically have to change from the table generator to the sequence generator and use a proper sequence. Now in this commit, all these entities were modified in order to use the sequence generator. So you have the possibility of using it. It's a great, uh, it's a great idea to, to do so. And if you're, doing, uh, if you're doing that, and now we are rerunning our test case, we can see that we can get rid of that, uh, we can get rid of this uh, table generator event. So we no, longer, we no longer have this one. So if we rerun this one, we're going to see every time we're doing one, one such modification, the number of uh, entity events is going to decrease. So we're going to have one less such entity event. So this is the table generator. I'm not sure how popular it is, I would assume it's not very popular, but then I just grabbed randomly an e-commerce application from GitHub and someone was using it. So I would assume that uh, maybe it's not that popular on, on, on every project, but it's not like uh, it hasn't been uh, ever used. So that's the problem with this API that you should never use them, like find all in spring data. You have a find all there and people say, yeah, everybody will use it properly. Well. That's naive to think. If you get something there and 99% uh, of the time you shouldn't call it, someone is going to call it even when they shouldn't have called it. Okay, so in this case, let's see what are the events we have here. In this case, there were seven and now we don't have that table generator anymore. We have bidirectional, many-to-many -many list, one-to-one -one without maps ID, null collections, eager fetching, that's very important, and uh, uh, string enumerations. All right, let's take the, another one. So we got rid of the table generator. That was one. Let's get rid now of the eager fetching. Now, why would I want to get rid of eager fetching? Eager fetching is probably one of the most common ways 
of generating performance problems. And it's bad because you see, it comes by default. So every time you're writing a, a simple many to one or one to one, you have it. Why? Because here, the default, as you can see here, it's fetch type eager. Now, why it's like that? It was 2006 and the expert group was about to vote about that. And uh, in, in that expert group, Hibernate has one vote. And Hibernate said that, no, it's not a good idea to have fetch type eager to any association. Why? Because Hibernate 3 actually had all associations lazy because previously in Hibernate 2, it was like that. All of them were eager and a lot of people were complaining about performance issues and they were misusing it. So Hibernate 3 switched to everything lazy and then JPA came and re-switched back to some of them being eager. Hibernate knew that it was a bad idea, so he voted against it, but it was overruled by other people. So as you can see, even the most popular uh, JPA provider voted against it, but it was overruled. In my opinion, it was a bad idea, which now requires you to do things explicitly, like setting the fetch strategy to fetch type lazy. Now, normally, you cannot just change it like that as I'm doing it here, and I can do it because I'm in a test. But normally, if you do it, you have to make sure that further down the line, you're not going to get lazy initialization exceptions because you are no longer initializing it. But if you have integration tests, at least the test will fail, and then you can take one after the other. Of course, you don't have to do it in one go. You can basically take one at a time. Change one, see if everything works correctly, then change another one over the course of uh, a longer period of time. So in this case, I had to change all of them. There are many, many such, uh, in many places uh, it was uh, used. And uh, now when we are running the test, we are, we are going to see that Hypersense Optimizer no longer complains uh, about it. That's nice. It's nice because we can basically take care of one issue and then we go back here and we see that it's no longer going to be detected. And then if you want, after when we're done, we can just inject issues and you will see that it can detect them automatically. Actually, we will change here. So I'm going to show you how it works. So again, it runs. Let's just jump directly to here because we're no longer interested in the configuration events. We're interested actually in this by event type. So now, after we took care of that eager fetching, now we only have five of them. There's no eager fetching event here. However, let's just go back to one of the places we, we were before, like sales manager. Let's, let, let me just find one of the entity in the Git. Cut, uh, catalog category entry. Catalog category entry, this one. So this one had a many one. Let's let's make this one eager and let's run it anew. Actually, let's go here and let's say now I inject it again. I inject it anew. Uh, one of my associations now it's using eager. Previously, I was having all of them, and I'm I'm saying that I shouldn't have any eager fetching event. But maybe someone gets a lazy initialization exception. They go to Stack Overflow where someone says, just make it eager. On Stack Overflow, sometimes you get good answers, other times you get quick answers, which only gives a quick relief because it doesn't really uh, fix, uh, fix the problem. So now we can see here that we still have one eager fetching event. Let's see which one, where is that one? It's in the catalog category entry, the entry attribute catalog. Let's go here. That's the one. So it was detected automatically. You cannot, uh, you can run, but you cannot hide from it. So it detects automatically whether, of course, this one here will fail. All right. So the next one, what else we have? Let's go to Git. So the next one, let's check that one. It's the one to one with many to one. So in this case, there were some one-to-one -one association. Basically, what, what is with this event is basically a one-to-one -one that doesn't have maps ID. Now, in um, the only way to map a true one-to-one -one type of relationship is if you're using maps ID. Without it, you're just using a many-to-one. 
And actually here, those should never have been one to one. They are not one to one. There are many to one. You have a foreign key. You have a foreign key which separated then the ID. And this one, it's uh, by mistake, it was made one to one because later you could go there and you see that there are queries written which fetch lists of products for this type of entity. So in this case, that one was by mistake. It should have been many to one. So there were just three entities that had this uh, issue. And if we run it here, now we will see that we no longer have that issue anymore. So little by little, you can go and uh, fix all of them one by one. And even at the end, when we fix all these mapping issues, you will see that you can still find uh, runtime specific uh, issues that are being detected at runtime. And those are valuable because you can get them even in the QA or in the production system. So in this case, if you're running it in debug mode, you will see that now we have only four. We got rid of that one. It was called one to one without maps ID. That was the issue. So we got rid of another one. Next one, which we want to get rid of is this one. Actually, this one is, uh, this one is very interesting here. It's many to many that uses list. It doesn't use set. Let's just take one such example. So this is a many to many association using a list. This is very popular. Why it's bad is because if you're doing, if you're using a list, every time you are removing an element, it's going to uh, delete everything from the intermediary table, from that uh, uh, joint table that you have in a many to many relationship, only to add the remaining elements that are in memory back. So that's not good. But if you're using a set, it works better. So that's uh, one thing that you should keep uh, keep in mind. Of course, if you do it like that, I had to change even in other places where uh, the list was used previously and now you have to use, uh, use, use it as a set. Or you can have something like an adapter in between them. So we, if we're running this anew, we can see that we get rid of that uh, issue. So basically it guides us into what changes we would need to do. Even if you don't have to do the changes, at least you are going to discover more about what configurations you might be missing or what your mappings are currently doing. You don't have to follow everything that is being indicated. Maybe some things, changing something would require a large effort that uh, you don't have resources to implement it. But at least you know about it. You can ignore any event. If you cannot fix it, you can, you can basically ignore it. You can use event filters and filter it out so that you are not being bothered by it. It's just an API in the end. It's just Java code. So in this case, we can see here that we got rid of that one. And the, the rest are, let's go, if they're easier, we can just jump, uh, jump three. So what else we have? This one here is, uh, we replaced the string. These are very popular. It's very popular for people to use this enumerated type string. Why? Because they see the value in the database and it's very appealing to use it, but it wastes a lot of space because for every uh, element you are going to take, in this case, you can see here, you are going to take uh, eight characters. For this one, seven characters. While if you're using an uh, ordinal, you're going to use a single byte to store them. Why do you care about that? It's because eventually all these uh, records are going to be stored in the buffer pool and you want to store there more records then fewer records, because if you store more, then you have to go less to the disk to load data. You can stay in the database memory for longer. So for that, you should strive to keep your tables as compact as possible. I mean, you don't have to use a long for the ID of a table where you would only have 100 records at most. Why use a long? Why waste so much space? Or maybe let's say that you have 100,000 elements. Let's say that those are customers and you're very successful. What it means? Maybe you have 1 million customers. 1 million customers, that's quite a lot. That's quite successful. But then do you need to use a 64-bit number to represent that? No, you can use an integer, which allows you to store 4 billion. I mean, if you have 4 billion customers, 
you are doing probably better than Google or some other company. And even if you can figure out that I will have 10,000 customers, you can use an integer. You don't have to use a long for everything. Make it as compact as possible. And that's why I used this enumeration. Other things, what we have here. In this case, that one was simple. It was a collection that was null. And now we initialize it. Why do we need to do it like that? Because then you don't have to check against nulls. And uh, basically this one is always initialized. Now normally Hibernate also replace it, uh, replaces it with a collection that it can be lazily loaded. And the last thing, let's just go to it. The last thing was bidirectional associations. We have bidirectional associations that don't synchronize. You don't have add and remove methods that synchronize both sides of this association. One example here, this catalog entity, I found it here, has some bidirectional association. You see those mapped by. So whenever I'm adding, it's called entry, I don't know, even the collections here are not properly, it should be something like catalog entries or something like that, or category entries, it's called just entry. The naming is really bad. But here we should have something like add entry, remove entry, or add category, or something like that. We should have this kind of methods. And hyperdistance optimizer can basically detect whether you have them or not. If you add all of them, now we're at the commit that basically added all those changes. So now, if we go here and rerun our tests, we're going to see that we got rid of these entity mapping events. We only have now we're only going to have the runtime events, which can be related to how long a query was running or how many elements it fetched or whether you have equals or hash code properly implemented in your entity. That one can also be uh, determined. In fact, someone actually told me about that today on GitHub because they were getting that equals and hash code event and uh, for good reasons, because the implementation was not proper and Hypersystems Optimizer basically ran the test and discovered that it was a bad implementation. It doesn't try to scan the code. It just tries to basically take one entity and go through all the entity state transitions. And if it fails the checks, then the implementation is wrong. So in this case, we can see that we got rid of the configurations and the entity mapping. No more, no more such uh, issues we have, but those are not the, the only ones that are left because you will see even after now, now there are queries that are being run. You see entity already managed. Why that one happens? They are calling, uh, they are calling save. You have that save being called and that save is going to, uh, to call uh, merge and we call merge on something that is already managed. It makes no sense. So we're not limited to configurations or to mapping events.